Welcome again, and right now we're at Acts chapter 7. This is Stephen's last words. It's his last defense against the Sanhedrin. And I know some of you might say, well, why should we even, you know, study this? Why should we even read this? Well, you see, Stephen was a man, it says, of great faith and great power. A man filled with wisdom and the Spirit of the Lord, a man filled with the Holy Spirit, a man that God used to perform great signs and wonders. You know, it doesn't tell us exactly what Stephen did in regards to signs and wonders. It just tells us that he did signs and wonders. This is one of the passages that every Christian should know and know well. If you notice, Acts chapter 7 is a fairly long chapter. I contemplated breaking this up into two or three parts, but then I decided against that because, you know, this is one whole speech of Stephen. This is like one whole sermon. And so breaking it up into different parts is almost like interrupting him. So we don't want to do that. So make time to listen to this whole thing from beginning to end in order to get it in full context and have the full impact of what Stephen has to say here. So just as a recap, we just came from Acts chapter 6. There were people who rose up kind of against the apostles and said, well, wait a second. The apostles here and these disciples disciples and these believers, they're preaching the word, but seems like they're neglecting the widows here. I mean, we know according to the scriptures, and that would be the so-called Old Testament scriptures, that the widows are very, very close to God's heart. And so they're like, well, it seems like the widows are being, you know, a little bit neglected here, you know, for the sake of preaching the word. And the apostles heard this complaint against them and they took it very seriously. They're like, yeah, that's right. That's true. We need to appoint men to look after the widows. So they appointed seven men to look after the widows to serve tables, which includes not only the widows, you know, in context, this would be all of the needy, you know, the widows, the poor, the fatherless and such. And so one of these men was Stephen. And as I said, Stephen was a great man, a very exceptional man, a man that we all can learn from. So Stephen was a man who was looking after the widows, who was serving tables, like a ministry to the needy, so to speak. But opposition arose against Stephen, and people began to hate him. And so they started producing false witnesses against him because they hated him so much. It says in Acts chapter 6, verse 13, false witnesses, false, keyword false here, witnesses arose against Stephen saying that, well, Stephen speaks against the holy place and speaks against the law, speaks against the Torah. And you see the Jewish rulers back in those days, they took great issue against that, and they should. You see, this was a false accusation that Stephen was actually speaking against the law. And you see, sadly enough, today, there are a lot of Christians, in fact, most Christians could actually be truly accused of that, okay? Speaking against the law of God. Say, oh, you know, throw away the law of God. We don't go by the law no more. A lot of Christians could be accused of that and it would be true accusations. This was a false accusation against Stephen. Keyword, false. In other words, Stephen never did preach against the Torah. In fact, he was pro-Torah, okay? That's what makes it a false accusation. And so this is where we pick up in Acts chapter 7. Stephen is brought before the tribunal of the Sanhedrin, pretty much like the judges of the nation of that day, and he's brought before the high priest. This is where we pick up. The high priest said, are these things so? In other words, is it true that you speak against Moses, the law, the Torah, the holy place. You know, is it true that you are saying anything against this? He said, this is Stephen speaking, brothers and fathers, listen. The glory of God appeared to our father Abraham, Abraham, when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and said to him, get out of your land and away from your relatives and come into a land which I will show you. And that is Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans. Another name for Chaldeans is Chastim. And lived in Haran. From there, when his father was dead, God moved him into this land where you are now living. 
He gave him no inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. He promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his offspring after him, when he still had no child. God spoke in this way, that his offspring would live as aliens or strangers in a strange land, obviously referring to Egypt, and that they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. Take note here that it says 400 years. Now, we read in other parts of Scripture that it was actually 430 years. And I say this a lot, and I'm going to say this again. A lot of people, especially a lot of Christians, they tend to really be nitpicky when it comes to Scripture. I mean, you know, it says 400, it's got to be 400. You know, it says this, it's got to be this. But a lot of times it just speaks in generalities or in approximations, okay? Don't get hung up on just all of the little details here. Read it in context and know that God is not necessarily caught up with all the little specificities, okay? Verse 7, I will judge the nation to which they will be in bondage, says God. Obviously speaking about the plagues upon Egypt. And after that, they will come out and serve me in this place. He gave him the covenant of circumcision. So Abraham became the father of Yitzhak, that's Isaac, and circumcised him the eighth day. Yitzhak became the father of Yaakov, Jacob, and Jacob became the father of the twelve patriarchs. The patriarchs moved with jealousy against Joseph, sold him into Egypt. I said this before that a lot of times jealousy is uh, is really not very good, okay? Cain killed Abel because of jealousy. Here we got all of Joseph's brothers, you know, doing what they did against Joseph just because of jealousy. But God was with him, speaking about Joseph, and delivered him out of all his afflictions. As a side note, it actually took years for God to deliver him out of all of his afflictions. That's why the scriptures talk about faith and patience and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now a famine came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and a great affliction. Our fathers found no food. But when Yaakov heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers the first time. On the second time, Joseph, Joseph that is, was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's race was revealed to Pharaoh. Joseph sent and summoned Yaakov his father and all his relatives, 75 souls. Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, himself and our fathers. And they were brought back to Shechem and laid in a tomb that Abraham bought for a price in silver from the children of Hamor of Shechem. But as the time of the promise came close, which God had sworn to Avraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt until there arose a different king who didn't know Joseph. The same took advantage of our race and mistreated our fathers and forced them to throw out their babies. Isn't that what we're seeing today? And may I add, every time there is a significant spiritual thing to happen, like the birth of Moses, you know, and the birth of Jesus, babies are slaughtered. Again, verse 9, the same took advantage of our race and mistreated our fathers and forced them to throw out their babies so that they wouldn't stay alive. At that time, Moshe was born and was exceedingly handsome. He was nourished three months in his father's house. When he was thrown out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and reared him as her own son. Moshe was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He was mighty in his words and works. But when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. Seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him who was oppressed, striking the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers understood that God, by his hand, was giving them deliverance, but they didn't understand. The day following he appeared to them as they fought and urged them to be at peace again, saying, Sirs, you are brothers. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? 
Moses fled at this saying and became a stranger in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. When 40 years were fulfilled, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. As he came close to see, a voice of the Lord came to him, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Avraham, the God of Yitzhak, and the God of Yaakov. Moses trembled and dared not look. The Lord said to him, Take off your sandals, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people that is in Egypt, and I've heard their groaning. I have come down to deliver them. Now come, I will send you into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? God has sent him as both a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, having worked wonders and signs in Egypt, in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness for forty years. This is that Moshe, that Moses, who said to the children of Israel, The Lord our God will raise up a prophet for you among your brothers like me. Very significant, like me. Because a lot of Christians look at Jesus as actually being like the opposite of Moshe, like the opposite of Moses. Verse 38, This is he who was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel that spoke to him on Mount Sinai, and with our fathers who received living revelations to give to us, to whom our fathers wouldn't be obedient, but rejected him and turned back in their hearts to Egypt, saying to Aharon, Aaron, Make us gods that will go before us. For as for this Moses... Who led us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. They made a calf in those days and brought a sacrifice to the idol and rejoiced in the works of their hands. But God turned and gave them up to serve the army of the sky. In the notes here, it says this idiom could also be translated the host of heaven or angelic beings or heavenly bodies. As it is written in the book of the prophets, Did you offer me slain animals and sacrifices forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tabernacle of Moloch, the star of your god Rephon, the figures which you made to worship. I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness, even as he who spoke to Moses commanded him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which also our fathers in their turn brought in with Yeshua, Joshua, when they entered into the possession of the nations, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers in the days of David, David, who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a habitation for the God of Yaakov. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and the earth a footstool for my feet. What kind of house do you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Didn't my hand make all these things? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so you do. Which of the prophets didn't your fathers persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one of whom you have now become betrayers and murderers. You received the law as it was ordained by angels and didn't keep it. Wow. I mean, Stephen really gave it to them there. I mean, here's Stephen fearlessly preaching to his opposition, to those who had power to kill him. I mean, a man, it says, whose face shone like the face of an angel. Very, very powerful. Verse 54, it says, Now when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Yeshua standing at the right hand of God. Notice, Yeshua was standing this time. He wasn't sitting. 
It was like the honorable reception of a wonderful servant. Verse 56, And Stephen said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man, Ben Adam, standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. Then they rushed at him with one accord. And that's the way it is. I mean, when you preach truth, people have the option of doing one or two things. One is actually humbling themselves and receiving the truth, or the other is stopping their ears and getting angry. They threw him out of the city and stoned him. The witnesses placing their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And we know this is the man who became Paul. They stoned Stephen as he called out saying, Lord Yeshua, receive my spirit. He kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Some people believe that it's because of Stephen's mercy to Saul. Praying to the Lord, don't hold this sin against them. The reason why Saul was actually given mercy by the Lord and was called and was saved and became Paul the Apostle. Another thing. If we go back to verse 38, this is a very, very important thing to notice and to understand. Verse 38, this is he who was in the assembly in the wilderness with the angel that spoke to him on Mount Sinai with our fathers who received the living revelations to give to us. Notice this word assembly. This is he, this Moses, that was in the assembly in the wilderness on Mount Sinai. The word assembly here in the original Greek manuscripts is ekklesia, which means church. When you read the word church in the so-called New Testament, it is translated from this Greek word ekklesia. The word assembly here, ekklesia, is the same word that's translated church. Now, in the beloved King James Version, you will see it says, actually, the church, okay? This is very significant because the church did not begin with the incarnation of Jesus, with the death of Jesus, with the resurrection of Jesus, or in Acts chapter 2. The church existed with Moses thousands of years ago, okay? And this is the same church. It's the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, you search the scriptures, obviously including the scriptures of Moses. You search the scriptures, the writings of Moses, thinking that in them alone you have life, but you don't understand those scriptures. What Moses wrote is all about me. Everything that Moses wrote is a reflection of me, okay? And that goes both ways. I mean, in Jesus' day, they searched the scriptures, the books of Moses, but they didn't recognize that what they were reading was actually the written form of the one who was standing right before them, Yeshua, Jesus. Today, we got the flip side. We got a lot of Christians who look at Jesus, but they don't see Jesus in the Torah. I'm telling you, you want to know Jesus better? Read the Torah. It's all about Jesus. Every command is about Jesus. Every command. And if your Jesus doesn't line up with the Torah, if your Jesus is not compatible with the Torah, you've got a false Jesus. You've got a golden calf Jesus, okay? Listen, there is one God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one church, one Torah, one God and Father of us all. God does not have double standards. He's not a hypocrite. He doesn't have multiple personalities. We serve one God who brought down one law, who was a reflection of his character, his eternal character that existed from before the creation of the world and will exist after everything is finished. The church existed before Jesus was ever incarnated. Christian, it's time to start expanding your knowledge about the scriptures. Jesus existed before the world began. That's very clear. 
Jesus was involved in the creation of the world. Moses knew Jesus, that is very clear. And the true people of God with Moses in the wilderness on Mount Sinai also knew Jesus. They were Christians as much as anybody else is, true Christians. They are the church, the church with Moses in the wilderness on Mount Sinai. May God bless you with wonderful revelation. Open the eyes of your understanding as you meditate upon these precepts. Seek him and you will find him. Call upon him and he will show you great and mighty things. Love you guys.